We talked about gene editing, essentially, CRISPR. What about synthetic biology? How does this fit in? First of all, what is synthetic biology? Thank you. Um, so, I mean, CRISPR, uh, which is clustered regularly into space, short palindromic repeats, for those of you who, who really want to know. <laughs> there won't be a test on that, I'm sure, but um, yeah, it's Thank quite you. a mouthful. Um, CRISPR, all, all gene editing, you know, reading, writing, and editing DNA comes under the the umbrella of synthetic biology. But synthetic biology is basically using the tools of molecular biology to manipulate life in ways like improving health, improving the environment, growing the economy. Um, it's uh, basically manipulating organisms to deliver the outcomes that you desire. And in many ways, it's been going on for, for as long as humans have been here. I mean, think about the birth of agriculture. Humans have been, you know, using or manipulating livestock and plants to produce our own desired ends. But um, as Keith has very well addressed, you know, we've, we've got tools now that we didn't have before. Um, tools uh, that are so powerful and so effective and so quick and so accurate um, and can be used by, you know, teenagers in high school labs. Um, that don't cost very much at all, um, but are so um, prolific in their outcomes that really it's a, it's a whole new world. It's a whole new world in which part of the world, because one of the concerns that obviously will arise here is who has access to this. You've talked about six forms, but six forms in Ethiopia, uh, six forms in areas of the world, you know, where we're desperate uh, for hunger and so on. I mean, are we talking about a um, a development of science which is contained within particular rich countries, or is there genuine, the, genuinely the possibility of this being utilised for the benefit of everybody? Well, um, there's two parts to that question, really. Um, uh, firstly, uh, yes, I mean, for better or worse, if you've got the money, and we're, we're only talking a few dollars here, you can order the genes that you want, you can order the bacteria that you want, you can order CRISPR-Cas9 and have it delivered to your high school lab in Ethiopia if you want. Um, you know, it, it is that easy. I mean, um, we've been talking mostly about big nation states like China, but my concern is more the nerd in his lab um, who's, who's just got a makeshift lab in his garage and orders the components and orders the genes and is playing in their garage. That's more my concern uh, over nations and labs and large institutions that are a lot more regulated and there's a lot more um, pressure and protocol to follow. Keith, is that your is that your concern as well? Do you share that concern? Yes, I do. I I think we need to separate out between modifying bacteria, which could be very straightforward and could be done uh, in in any lab, and as Sam has said, is very cheap. Um, if we were to do that, to, to take it to modifying a, a higher organism, such as a human, that then requires very complex technology and uh, a sophisticated machinery. So I, I, nobody's going to be modifying the human genome and making enhanced humans in their garage. But <laughs> the process of, of, of modifying bacteria um, is fairly straightforward. Or, or a virus, for that matter. Yes. Um, well, you're, really, you're really cheering me up at this point. <laughs> when I hear that, I uh, yes, carry on. Having just come through COVID, I start to get a bit bothered by it. Yes, Sorry. I, I don't want to sort of set anyone off on any conspiracy theory or anything like that. But um, no, I, I'm an optimist on this front. I, I, we've started kind of quite negatively, but I, I think um, for all people's excitement about artificial intelligence and what it can do, I think synthetic biology offers the most hope and, and the best prospects for. Um, a, a huge wealth of positive change that seemingly touches everywhere. Which sort of change? What are your hopes? Specific, can you be specifically about what do you think we'll be, we will be able to achieve, which will be beneficial? Well, firstly, I think there are genetic diseases that could go the way of the dodo and smallpox. You know, um, diseases like Huntington's disease, sickle cell, um, uh, Tay-Sachs disease, diseases that are a very well-known single genetic change. Um, you could theoretically get rid of them in a generation if um, if you went at it. Then you've got cancer. I mean, that's that's my area of research is is cancer. Uh, cancer is a completely different ball game. I'm very excited about 
where the world could be in terms of cancer in 10 years time for example um everything from car t cells um immunotherapy um the, you know these are the things we've been waiting for forever uh, they're the great equalizer if as long as the costs can come down um the promise of cancer therapy is is totally different from what it was uh, a decade ago um then you have um things like space that's something i do some research on um in in terms of uh, people staying long term um in low earth orbit but also on the moon and yes even theoretically on mars um but then you've got ecofuels the development of ecofuels you've got de-extinction i mean that's fun right isn't it bring back the woolly mammoth and the <laughs> the carrier pigeon <laughs> whoa whoa it's, it's keith i just detect a little bit of reservation here <laughs> i have more more reservations than sam over this I, I think the potential for its good use are immense uh, for its use in, in particularly in medicine um i'm less optimistic about curing those genetic diseases i think we could do that in individuals but wiping them out internationally it would be i think pretty much impossible and some of them are sporadic occurring anyway so they would only reoccur with 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 time right. um some of them i think is is pipe dreaming but i am actually worried about the misuse of those technologies. Do you mind if we come, Keith, just to those? Uh, I'm trying to be optimistic at this stage of our discussion, <laughs> if I may. I'm, I'm naturally, I think, half glass empty sort of person, so we've plenty. Of <laughs> but I mean, just just to when we talk about de extinct, uh, de extinct, um, this means uh, what does this mean? Does this mean that wherever we can find in the world mm. genes of some extinct? animal we will be able to bring them back to life and if necessary we we will see woolly mammoths roaming the earth or what are we talking about with de-extinction no it, it, I, I think at best we could invent a new species that resembles the woolly mammoth rather than actually because the dna from those species uh, of ages ago will be it's it's degraded it's not the, the sort of jurassic park um so you can we can now we can sequence the Neanderthal genome. It's been done. You can sequence the woolly mammoth genome, but how are you then going to reconstruct that? And how, what is going to be the mother for this new woolly mammoth? And how is it going to deal with the learned behaviours that elephants and woolly mammoths would have? Um, it's all very well having an African elephant, but that's not the environment in, in, in which a woolly mammoth ever lived. And how are those offspring going to learn how to behave as a woolly mammoth? So, Sam, when you're talking about de-extinction, what do you mean? Yes, uh, it, it's woolly mammoth with an asterisk, uh, with, with all respects to George Church, who I, I hugely admire. Um, I, I mean, this, this isn't just hey, George, a, me. a... George Church is... Um... George Church is a very, very famous geneticist, uh, prize winner, who um, uh, is responsible for the efforts to bring back the woolly mammoth um, right. using gene editing technology and synthetic biology technology. Um, so obviously there are no woolly mammoths left. So you, you basically need to create a woolly mammoth Indian. I think Indian elephant is the closest homologue to it. Uh, and it's, it's, it would be a hybrid. Um, there are problems like a woolly mammoth has 58 chromosomes um whereas i think elephants have got 56 so you would need to engineer cells um and then you would um th this this is theoretical partly because it's not been done yet and partly because this technology is still very new so what although we've used, we've what used would, like, what would be the point of it sam Why oh, would huge environmental um point to it we have serious climate issues and woolly mammoths were walking over the Siberian steeps, um, tromping down the, the permafrost. Underneath that permafrost is enough methane to set off an incredible chain reaction of climate catastrophe. Um, so it's hugely beneficial to bring back woolly mammoths um, and have them range over Siberia like they used to, um, because it, it will keep that permafrost down, keep it frozen. So um, it is, um, you know, it, there's, there's a rationale to it. It's not just, oh, let's bring back a woolly mammoth. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Keith appreciates the rationale there. Keith, you've got. I, I take the rationale, but I think it's rather a pipe dream because it's not going to. You're not going to need one or two woolly mammoths. You're going to need a whole. I don't know what the right freight herds of, of yeah. woolly mammoths to do that. And as I say again, I think they um, their learned behaviours. We have no means of uh, of teaching woolly mammoths what to do. The other thing that worries me over the de-extinction 
Uh, it's if we can bring species back, then why should we bother about extinction now? And the whole environmental um, impetus for protecting species. Why should we bother with that if we know that, well, if, if they happen to go extinct, it's not forever anymore. We can bring them back. No, but it's it's not either or. It's 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 both and. It's it's certainly never going to be a replacement strategy. But I'll give you another example. The um the American um uh gosh uh, American chestnuts. They used to be absolutely prolific all throughout the east coast of the United States, and uh, and they've been driven almost completely away through deforestation, but also through um through blight by um, fung fungal blight. Um, now there's a project to um, reintroduce engineered American chestnuts um, up, up the East Coast, but with a gene that's been modified to help uh, fungal resistance. Now I, I think environmentally that's extremely worthwhile. Um, you know, it was very important for, for bears, for squirrels, for um, caterpillars, which obviously you know, huge, hugely important for the ecosystems. You know, that's that's a that seems to me a very worthwhile effort. If you've got in your hand the power to do something like that, which which we didn't 10 years ago, but we do now. Um, I think that's a, a great example. I, I also, you know, a lot of work that's going on with coral reefs and with corals, trying to help engineer them to um, uh, defend them and protect their algae so that they can flourish a lot better. So, I mean, woolly mammoths are the, the poster child for it. But um, but there's a lot of other good stuff there. <laughs> 